I'm Marty Stauffer. When we were kids growing up here in Arkansas, our parents were very understanding. They let us keep orphaned wild baby animals as pets until they were old enough to release on their own. There was Stanley the beaver. He lived in the bathtub nibbling willow branches. And Leona the owl soared through the house as she was learning how to fly. Foxy the fox shared the food dish with our family dog. I learned a lot watching these babies. But the wild baby around the house these days is my daughter, Hannah. She can't seem to keep her nose out of things. Curiosity and exploration are all part of growing up for both human and animal children. Just as with human babies, childhood is the age of delight exploration and discovery for animal babies. But unlike humans, the fragile creatures of the wild face great danger. To live, they must graduate from the toughest school of all, the school of survival. Many people study animals in hope of gaining insight into human behavior, why we do the things we do. I believe we can learn a great deal about the nature of all life by experiencing this most wonderful age of innocence. Journey with me to the world of wild babies. With spring comes the miraculous season of growth and rebirth. As the days grow longer, birds become driven by the overwhelming urge to reproduce. Soon they are ready to perform the rituals that have taken place in the same way at the same time for thousands of years the annual rites of spring. The female ruffed grouse, ignored by the male during the rest of the year, suddenly becomes the object of his affection. With tail fanned and neck feathers ruffed, the male poses proudly, hoping to catch the female's eye. She seems unimpressed now, but soon enough, their powerful reproductive instincts will bring them together. There are several reasons for all the sound, movement, and color of mating season. Males drive off rivals and, eventually, attract females of their own species. With some birds, like the mallards, Mating becomes a community event and is exciting when males greatly outnumber the females. One male will finally prevail and then a pair of ducks will mate. Soon the female will lay her eggs and after a long period in the shell, ducklings will break out. Bright-eyed, able to feed themselves and follow mother almost from the instant of birth, most other baby birds emerge early from their shells, feeble, blind, featherless, dependent on their parents for food and care. Some babies are comic caricatures of their parents. Even the red-tailed hawk, a mighty bird of prey, has helpless young. For several weeks after the nestlings hatch, they are able to do little more than open their mouths and eat. When they are old enough to leave the nest, they will be taught to hunt 
and by next winter will be powerful hunters like their parents. After the sun is set, when the moon rises high above the trees, many nocturnal animals, specifically adapted for living at night, are awake and active. 75 feet off the ground lives the great horned owl and her young downies. The owl often takes an abandoned red tail's nest as its own. Because one hunts by day and the other by night, these two predatory birds coexist peacefully. Nighttime is also feeding time for the possum, but when reaching for the juiciest persimmon, it finds that often the best bites are just out of reach. Owls can find their prey in 100 times less light than is needed for humans to see. Their eyes are among the most remarkable and versatile in the world. A male American toad, smitten by the moon in June, sings to his lady love. However, there's more to winning a lady's heart than singing. The eager males must first fight off each other. They grab anything that moves, even a salamander happening by. When one male toad grabs another male, the latter emits a few chirps, a warning call, meaning keep your hands to yourself. The captive toad is then released. There's nothing secretive or subtle about the courtship of toads. The male has found a female, much larger than himself. He's already prepared for the size difference. Horny nuptial pads on his hands help him to grip and hold the female. Even though he is the successful suitor, he must fight off rivals up to the very moment of egg laying. Each black speck in the gelatinous string of eggs is a toad embryo. As many as 8,000 eggs may be laid. After mating, male and female toad go their separate ways, leaving the eggs to develop on their own. For cold-blooded creatures, lack of parental care is the rule. Species survival depends on extravagant overproduction. Under favorable conditions, tadpoles may emerge in three days. Other animals will eat many of the eggs and tadpoles, but countless numbers survive. In two months, the toadlets are ready to return to land, where they will remain until they mature and are called to the water for the annual rites of spring. Almost all births are timed for spring, when food is plentiful and the young's chances of growing into adulthood are greatest. But mating season may have taken place at another time of year. For instance, bighorn sheep mate in November, wolves in February, bears in July, and the American elk in September. To female elk, the bull's shrill bugle means, I'm ready for love. To other bull elk, the bugle means something entirely different. It's a challenge, saying, I'm ready not for love, but for war. Challenge accepted, the two huge bulls, each weighing nearly half a ton, begin the battle.
Except for an accidental goring or locking of antlers, the battle is never to the death. It ends when the weaker bull gives in. And for the time being, the question of who is stronger is settled. Settled only until a larger bull arrives and takes up the challenge again. The largest and mightiest bull eventually wins over all the others. His prize, a harem of a dozen or more females with which he mates. Next spring's calves will be hardy and alert. Their chances for survival, and in fact, the survival of the elk as a species, are improved by the results of these ritualistic mating battles. The strongest bulls mate and father the strongest calves year after year. The baby pronghorn antelope will grow up to be the speedster of the plains, but right now, the fawn's life with its mother is slow and easy. It consists of nursing and resting in the sagebrush, hiding from predators. People coming upon baby animals alone in the wild often assume them to be orphaned or abandoned. This is seldom true. Usually mother is feeding nearby. When my friend Diane discovers this pronghorn fawn, the pronghorn mother is torn between her maternal instinct and her survival instinct, her desire to flee from danger. The fawn solves mother's dilemma by running when touched. The fawn needs to stay with its mother for the next few months and learn defense tactics and survival skills so that one day it too can run fast and free. These baby catfish look as if they are playing a game. They're not. They're schooling. Schooling is an adaptation developed over years of evolution. By swimming together, many little fish look like one big fish, a fish so big that most predators pass it by. The lower animals seldom engage in free activity, in play, an activity beyond the ritual and routine. The higher the animal, the more it plays. Once the demands of instinct, such as the need for food or sleep, have been satisfied, animals have the time and inclination to play. True play is aimless, with no goal other than to experience new sensations. Children do not play because they are young, but rather, they are young so that they may play. This human saying can also be applied to wild babies. Mountain goat kids attempt to leap and climb only minutes after birth a natural outlet for their incredible energy. No doubt, all this leaping and romping strengthens their muscles and hones their climbing skills. But don't tell the young goats that. For them, the useful benefits of play are merely side effects. The wild babies do learn and play at the same time. I think we can gain something from this. Perhaps we could find a way to play less desperately and to learn more playfully.
Learning is unlike play in that learning has a goal, a skill needing perfection. This skill, never perfect the first time, needs practice. There's an intruder in ground squirrel territory. A sentry sounds the alarm, and they race for their burrows, all except one. A young ground squirrel's curiosity often leads to its undoing. Luckily for this baby, I'm just as curious as it is. This youngster must learn the burrow escape trick if it is to survive. There are too many predators, hawks, coyotes, badgers, that will end the squirrel's life if it doesn't learn to curb its curiosity. I replace the youngster in its burrow and hope that next time it won't come out to meet me. The flying squirrel has another kind of skill. Its home, more often than not, is in the air. Their front and back legs are connected by a flap of skin, the gliding membrane. Young flying squirrels are born helpless and hairless, weighing only one-fifth of an ounce each. In several weeks, they are fully furred. Yet even when nearly grown, they look like someone wearing a fur coat several sizes too big. It's time for the first flying lesson. While mother watches, the young squirrels turn into furry kites. They learn to steer by raising and lowering their flaps and to stabilize landings by using their tails. This landing is beginner's luck, but beginners don't always fly through the air or land with the greatest of ease. The object is to glide from tree to tree. However, you can't always get what you want. This youngster must swim to shore, climb a tree, and fly, fly again. It will be several months before the techniques are perfected. Flying squirrels could be more aptly called gliding squirrels, since they don't truly fly. As with most animal young, the main parent, the one that instructs and cares for the offspring, is the female. Mother bear is hard pressed to keep her active cubs out of trouble, or even in sight at times. Bear cubs are among the most curious and playful of all the wild babies, because they are the most intelligent. They love exploring. Exploration is a search to satisfy their boundless curiosity. But this time, the information smells terrible. Unfortunately, the cub has never seen a skunk before. There is no recess period in the school of survival. Any encounter can prove to be highly educational. These skunks seem to think that I am their mother. How could that be? Well, I'm not about to hang around and find out. I had seen and smelled how well mother skunk protected her babies. Although the youngsters wander off and sometimes will follow any large moving object, they will return to their mother. Like human children, the young skunks are imprinted on their mother. A powerful social bond exists between them. This bond allows the babies to learn from her. Here, for instance, where to find the juiciest grubs and insects. The skunk mother is a teacher, a teacher in the sense that she adjusts her actions to her students or babies' needs. 
Like the skunk, the porcupine has a very powerful defense mechanism. Quills, up to 30,000 of them. The quills resemble the shaft of a bird's feather, but the business end of each quill is hard, very sharp, and under complete muscular control. Porcupines normally have a single baby. At birth, it is well developed and has soft quills. Some of these start to harden soon after birth. And at this stage, the baby instinctively knows to slap its tail at any danger. In addition to being a defense mechanism, the quills, being hollow and air-filled, serve as a built-in life preserver. Mother porcupine could be called a model mother model in the sense that unlike the skunk, she does not alter her actions for her baby. She proceeds as usual, serving as an example for baby to follow. The baby must catch up as best it can. In the spring, both wander far looking for tender, crisp plants tree bark, shrubs, and berries. Porcupines are never nervous or hurried. They have 30,000 reasons not to be. Mother doesn't worry about this coyote pup. If he gets any closer, he could end up with a pin cushion for a nose. Raccoons have the most nimble forepaws of any North American animal. Like tiny human hands, they're very useful in climbing and clinging. And no matter how good the tool, the skill needed to use it must be learned. Mother raccoon, like the skunk, is a teacher she encourages her uncertain youngsters. One baby almost across, mother turns to the other and tries to convince it to follow. But lessons don't always go according to plan. Happily, the baby is a born swimmer. This baby, after seeing its twin fall, begins to take its climbing lesson more seriously. frustrated teacher decides it's time to take a break. And what started as a climbing lesson turns into a swimming session. Finally, the whole family, wet but safe, reaches shore. Although the lesson may not have looked successful, the skills learned may prove vital in the near future. A cougar approaches the tree where the raccoon family is resting. Mother sends her babies to the top and faces down the cougar alone. For an animal parent, teaching and guarding the young often become a simultaneous process. This raccoon, like all wild mothers, 
does not release her babies from her care until they have learned all the necessary survival skills. Then they will leave her, find mates, and produce their own wild babies. Some say a baby moose has a face only a mother could love. Or maybe it's a mother has a face only another moose could love. What really counts is that her calf is hardy and has a place to grow and run free. National parks provide some refuge for wild creatures. Here we can watch them and learn about their world. Where instinct plays a greater role than intellect, where wildness reigns. Only now, when the wilderness areas are vanishing, only now are we beginning to understand the value of observing animals in their natural habitat. They have a great deal to teach us about themselves and ourselves. I believe they can survive only if we stop exploiting the wilderness and leave them a home where they can raise their wild babies. I remember as a kid playing with fox pups at a den, right over there. They'd come out when the parents were away hunting. And right here, watching bass spawning in the shallows of a lake. Times change. You can see that they do. We can't be blindly opposed to all progress, but we should be opposed to blind progress. We should protect wildlife habitat now so that our children and grandchildren can also appreciate the wild babies. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.